the kind of more empty seats emerge, and that's precisely not the right way that things should happen because the lecturers actually get better as a semester. <laughs> So it's thank you so much for coming, and it's a great pleasure for me to inter introduce tonight's design studio, Bureau V, which is comprised of three partners, Stella Lee, Laura Trevino, and Peter Zuspin, who also join us this semester as visiting critics, and two of the group, Peter and Laura, are here with us tonight. So all three partners, um, each with architecture degrees from Columbia University as well as elsewhere, have worked for kind of fantastic architects and designers prior to starting their own practice, including Asmatote Architecture, Diller and Scafidio Renfrew, Richard Meyer and Partners, and Eisman Architects, among others. They have also individually and collectively taught at Columbia and at the University of Kentucky's College of Design uh, and continue to do so. So in practice since 2007, uh, they described themselves as, and I'm quoting them, from their website, designing innovative architecture and experimental projects ranging from cultural and commercial work to performances, installations, and events. And it's really this expanded kind of repertoire of deliverables that seems to me an essential component of their work. So both cultural institutions, such as the Original Music Workshop and the Montella Foundation, as well as artists and designers, such as Early Morning Opera, Arto Lindsay and Mary Ping are among their clients and collaborators, and current projects include a chamber music concert hall for contemporary classical music and a multifamily residential building in Brooklyn. So all, although a relatively young practice, their work has been exhibited or performed at uh, many numerous um, and admirable venues like the Guggenheim Museum, the Vien Venice Biennale of Art, and Los Angeles Red Cat Theater. Now, I have not yet had the opportunity to visit one of their projects or go to one of their events, but I'm struck by their kind of wild diversity and their equal provocation. So from the sensitive and minimal adaptive reuse of the Rockaway Museum of Contemporary Art as a kind of seasonal museum and community space to the renovation of a former sawdust factory uh, into a venue for young musicians, from the, a kind of off-the-grid complex that provides the kind of simultaneous immersion in and protection from the extreme landscape of Northeast Nevada to a kind of small installation of brightly painted stainless steel masses intended to, under, un, to kind of enliven public spaces in New York, and from a pr processional performance event in Times Square to a performance piece that presents a kind of war trauma in the Red Cat, this kind of emergent firm certainly promises to create new things. And I, that's, a, that's a kind of a quote from one of the partners, a Zussman quote, to create new things. And expand not only the appearance of architecture in unconventional forums, but perhaps more importantly in unconventional forms. So please join me in welcoming Peter and Laura of Bureau B. Can you hear me? Does that work? Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Julia, for the uh, invitation and the introduction. Um, we're really happy to be here both as uh, faculty this semester, visiting critics, um, as well as here tonight. Um, again, my partner Laura is in the front, uh, and unfortunately Stella could not make it tonight, uh, but I think she appears in some images somewhere, so we can hopefully suss her out. Um, <clears throat> let me get this started. Okay, um, so our, our studio, as, as Julia has mentioned, has been working on a, a number of projects um, from small to large. Uh, you know, our work has ranged from installations to Fashion Week. Um, we're based in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, in New York City, where uh, I live, luckily, but my, my partners have a little bit of a worse commute. Um, but just to walk you through a couple of the, the projects that we've done uh, to give you some sort of key visually in terms of um, our, our past. This is a project that we did, uh, a series of three actually, this is one of three for the conceptual fashion label Slow and Steady Wins the Race. Um, they produce on a different schedule than your classic uh, fashion timeline where they come out with one thing every three to four months, um, maybe two, and they do this sort of very slow process and, and each item is made in a, a quantity of 100 um, and they're sold until they're done. So it's this sort of different uh, approach to what fashion could be. Um, 
and we work with them for this installation. This was at the Saatchi and Saatchi building uh, in New York City. Uh, and from fashion installations to actually fashion itself, uh, last fall we actually uh, did a small menswear capsule collection, very loosely based um, on certain ideas of Gottfried Zemper. Um, so this is a, an image from one of the photo shoots for it. Uh, as well as a, a lot of our work, as, as was mentioned, is very um, related to performance. This is a diagram from a performance we did in collaboration with the musician Arto Lindsay. Uh, this is for a, a sort of surround uh, speaker system where we crafted this kind of multi-track noise piece um, that for the uh, arts complex Inyo Chim um, in Brazil uh, for one of their openings. Uh, this is sort of an abstract drawing of one of the, the maps of the, the composition and the actual site where it was located. Uh, the piece was called Hem of the Forest, which so it was literally sitting on this this point in uh, the northern sort of mountainous Brazil uh, on the, this opening uh, in the landscape uh, but surrounded directly by this pretty rich jungle. Um, another performance collaboration we did with uh, Arto Lindsay again, this was for the Venice Biennale of Art, I think in 2000, I can't remember when, 2009 I believe, maybe 2011, um, in which we made another sort of spatial noise piece where there were these carts that were running down and this actually opened uh, the Biennale, this is the main um, street leading up to the Giardini, um, a couple other photos. And we um, performed with 50 masked dancers who sort of moved with us, choreographed um, by uh, a member of the Frankfurt, the former um, Frankfurt Ballet. Um, another project, and so, you know, these previous projects have all been uh, another rather fast, right? These are sort of earlier things in our, our um, practice and as you'll sort of know if you don't know already um, often as you get started you have to do these projects that are very quick just to sort of get get things rolling um, and we still like to do them very frequently to sort of keep uh, the longer trajectory projects in check uh, this was a performance piece that we did in collaboration with Assume Vivid Astro Focus they're a um, arts collective mostly based uh, with two, uh, sorry, mostly led by a duo, one in uh, Sao Paulo and Brooklyn and the other one in Paris. And this was at the Guggenheim Museum. Um, we put this together with their sort of masked dancers uh, and their uh, visual projection artists. We provided the sort of soundtrack for it. And we did it in two days. Um, so this was for a Kandinsky exhibition. Uh, another project that we've been working on for quite some time is um, thinking through architectural drawing uh, and thinking about, you know, all the projects that we've done that never get realized, how to give them a home, um, something that's for us, uh, not so much for a, a client or otherwise. So this is uh, an installation of a couple of our, our drawings that were based off of projects that never happened. Um, some earlier images showing us working on these projects. Uh, and there's... Stella right there, um, taping and, and painting gold on one of our drawings. And these three, as you can tell, are, are, are fairly massive. This one is eight feet by 15 feet and three panels. Um, this was for a facade project in New Jersey. It never happened. Um, this one for, was for another competition for a, a tower. And as you can see, we're sort of working with things outside of strict representation, either for a client or for any kind of construction purposes but more so <clears throat> trying to loosen up the drawing a little bit and, and think about ways that we can actually use it as a, a final document for ourselves. Uh, this one was for a performance piece that was to be at the Whitney Museum, um, which naturally got defunded. Um, <laughs> so again, something that we can really use uh, our own work and, and get something for us to keep. Um, and then for the last five, maybe six years, we've been working on this, which will be our first building. Um, which we're very excited about. It's literally about a 10 minute walk from our studio in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, and this is the home for the original music workshop, uh, a nonprofit which we actually helped found uh, with the owner um, of the property. And it will be a, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting young musicians, new composers, um, and the, the production of new compositions. It is in a former sawdust factory. Um, located about a block from the East River, about two blocks from the first subway stop into Williamsburg. Um, and we, we decided to sort of keep the exterior of the building uh, there because if you've ever been to Williamsburg, there's sort of this tabula rasa model of eradicate everything that's there and build glass towers. Um, so there's a few brick warehouses, and for good reason. A lot of it sort of looks like this clapboard Western movie set. Um, but there's a few good brick buildings, that, and we luckily were able to find one. <clears throat> 
um, the lobby space of that building. Um, this is an interior rendering of what the, the, the space will look like. It's actually quite small, real chamber music hall size, roughly 30 by 50 feet with a surrounding balcony. Um, it has this uh, perforated skin that wraps around it, which allows for the, the acoustic treatments to sit behind it. Um, and the visual, the, the, it's a composite of fabric and perforated metal, which allows for a sort of visual opacity but acoustic transparency. So all of those variable acoustics actually sit behind it, um, which allows us to sort of tune the room to the uh, instrumentation that's happening, be it amplified or otherwise. Uh, an exterior night rendering. Um, there's actually going to be a two-story restaurant along um, 6 North 6th Street here. Another shot of the interior. And this will open a year from now, if all goes well. Um, a drawing of, an early drawing of the uh, perforation pattern that we've been working on. The detail of that. So it sort of sits as this kind of jewel-like object uh, that we've then sliced into a lot of these pieces to sort of allow all of the kind of auxiliary materials to sit behind the, the backdrop. And part of our construction documents that shows the roughly 200 panels that make up this piece. Um, but actually what I'd like to do for the, the rest of the talk is not actually talk about the work that we've completed or will soon be completed, um, but I'd like to actually focus on um, a project we're kind of just beginning. Um, so in light of this, please grant me some leeway as this project sits in its sort of gentle fetal stages um, at a point sort of before design but kind of after idea. Um, while some pens have kind of hit paper in our studio and we've done some design work on this, uh, up until now it's really mostly research uh, and mostly a project about text and responses to text. It's just now sort of getting visual, which this is a big first step in. Um, so for me, the, the use of text is a kind of important part of my process uh, as an architect. And I'll get into this in a bit more detail, kind of as we go through the story. So I'll begin with this. A quotation from Adolf Loos from a modestly titled essay, essay of about 100 years ago called Architecture. If we were to come across a mound in the woods, six foot long by three feet wide, with the soil piled up in a pyramid, a somber mood would come over us, and a voice inside us would say, there is someone buried here. This is architecture. So I'm sure hopefully you guys have encountered this quotation before. Uh, if not, hopefully soon. Um, my first impression of a text like this, uh, if you think about the sort of history of European architecture at this period, is that it seems a bit morose. Um, and hardly what I would consider a kind of paradigmatic definition for this sort of powerfully altruistic discipline of architecture, which is about to heroically embark on its modernist period. Um, but the part of this that I, I really do enjoy is that perhaps the kind of nostalgia on my part, but um, it's kind of base nature. You know, it's not about the sort of lofty goals. It's actually really trying to define this in a, in a, a much more base manner of what, what architecture is. I mean, a man is dead, right? <laughs> It could easily be said that this imagery is about memory, you know, that he's trying to portray in this text, the memory of a man who has passed away. However, I mean, this isn't really the case if you look at this text, right? Loos treats this, I think, as Rosalind Krauss or Charles Peirce might call it, as a kind of index, a sort of loose sign. So there's, you know, there's no nameplate, there's no tombstone sort of identifying the mound's contents mentioned. You know, Loos's we uh, in this text seems to come upon this structure without prior knowledge of its identity, only its shape, its sighting, and its sort of proportional pyramid indicate that a man lies here. So, you know, we make that connection through it, um, not as a strict sort of sign or some convention that we know, but through, through much baser means. But I think it's important to note here that that realization of what it is actually comes, um, does not come first in the mind of the we of Los, right? His words first describe a mood a mood which comes before the utterance of the mound's identity. Um, so uh, that's a big part about what I'm about to get into. So I, I think Losis We combines this, this feeling with uh, intellectual codification of some sort of meaning. But the feeling precedes the meaning. Um, and this combination of mood and sort of deduced evidence, um, we then find architecture, right? It's the sort of the two things together. 
Um, and I, I think at the same time, for most of us in the room, this sort of base structure that he's describing would not really constitute sort of capital A architecture. Um, and I, I think there are reasons for that. So the story then leads me to this figure. In the, in the sixth century, a theologian philosopher depicted here named Pseudo Dionysius um, was the first to codify in writing, at least in the Western, Western world, uh, a direct relationship between light and God. Now, I'm sure that idea has sat with man for you know, possibly a much longer history than that, but he's the first person to sort of write it down. Um, and so now, you know, this sort of basic phenomenon in the world has been linked to the divine and is sort of associating light now with goodness, with morality. Um, and I think this elision has had a power, powerful effect on humanity, whether innate to us or culturally inherited in some capacity. And its effect on architecture is specifically powerful. <clears throat> From the, uh, you know, massive glass uh, structure, sorry, where was I? My fear, yeah. Yes, um, from the massive glass, you know, of a, of a Gothic cathedral to the expansive landscape windows of, of modernist glass houses to the neo-corporate residential curtain walls, um, this importance of light in architecture seems as much a requirement as its structural stability nowadays. So to go through, a, you know, a couple examples, obviously this is a, an early modernist Mies drawing up his tower on, on Friedrichstrasse, so much more contemporary drawings, um, most notably from our sort of fathers in architecture. This is Asymptote. This is Diller's Video Renfro. <laughs> um, as well as perhaps a little bit more of a cynical one from OMA of their design for a coach building in Tokyo. Um, so, you know, light has taken on a value of architecture that's moved beyond this sort of kind of religiosity uh, that pseudo Dionysius might be associated with, or any sort of belief system, and it's really becoming a, and has become a kind of fundamental part of our contemporary definition of architecture. As architect, architects, we don't believe in light; we simply don't know architecture without it. So it's not really a belief anymore; it's really part of the definition. Um, so I'm obviously slipping a little bit in between the the literal and the metaphoric um, rather rapidly, and I think with sort of little, literal, uh, excuse me, little regard for its kind of causality, or characterizing it, and I think we'll sort of get into that as we go along. But let's stay in this space for a little bit longer. Um, I think we can all agree that generally the practice of architecture is fundamentally altruistic. If you're doing this for the money, I think you've sort of made a poor choice. Um, yet I would like to argue that this altruism has, in my opinion, become too myopic. So um, a couple of years ago, like it happens in everybody's lives, I was broken up with, right? And so in my sort of pathetic state of depression, you know, I rewatched Melancholia. I listened to the magnetic fields on repeat. Um, you know, I also, I love to watch horror movies. It's something that I, as a child, was sort of denied um, through Catholic parents. Um, and, you know, even bad ones, a sort of distraction and, and gore and derelict violence can be very pleasurable. Um, and sometimes they are profound. Like the focused fear of Kubrick's The Shining um, and the portrait of an all-too-familiar anxiety in Todd Haynes' phenomenal film, Safe, where the crisp cleanliness of the modern world seems to unravel into poison for a suburban housewife. Um, and it's interesting, too, of course, that these two films, uh, both of them have a very strong role of architecture in the telling of their stories. You know, or the Gothic Baroque of Matthew Barney's work, or the rich anger in A Song of Liturgy or Crawlis. Um, as the novelist Joyce Carol Oates states, the predilection for art that promises we will be frightened by it, shaken by it, at times repulsed by it, seems to be as deeply imprinted in the human psyche as the counter-impulse towards daylight, rationality, scientific skepticism, truth, and the real. So I think part of my work comes from kind of sheer jealousy, <laughs> right? But I, I think it's more than that, um, you know, of these other art forms. <laughs> I think contemporary architecture is rarely interested, at least, again, in my opinion, in accommodating, let alone producing, such powerful and grand parts of the human psyche. There is a hole that has been left empty in our discourse, and it is this lack of attention to darkness that I would like to focus on. Um, you know, this is obviously a reactionary position, uh, and we'll get into that and, and why I think that's actually a good thing. <clears throat> 
So architecture's trouble with these kind of darker ideas, I think, may lie in its relationship to utility, right? It's design. It's not, it doesn't have the freedom of art. It's not for pleasure. It's not for pure thought. Uh, we do have to provide some sort of function. Um, but I don't think this is enough to support the absence of this interest. Architecture, you know, it may also be economically sort of client services industry, um, but it is still an altruistic profession, and I think our continued relationship with the university and philosophical discourse has worked for centuries to sort of undermine this pure utility of practice or of work. So I don't think that's enough to explain architecture's cultural, um, relative cultural disinterest in this topic. Um, another problem for architecture, I think, is its... Um, situation, right? Literature and many other disciplines have come to terms with utopia. Um, they've come to terms with it in its value, it, sorry, they've come to terms with it being valuable in its conception alone. Whereas architecture has this sort of constant history of always wanting to create it. Um, this is the, uh, an overhead shot of the um, FLDS in Texas that was raided a few years ago. Um, uh, which I think, at least in America, is a long line of um, sort of sometimes religiously infused series of utopias that have been built and then end up disappearing. I don't know the status of this one currently. but um, So architecture seems sort of stuck in this, in this will to forcibly create this over and over again. Um, by definition, it is unachievable, yet still the noble heroic architect must try. Um, However, I think luckily within the architectural history, um, there have been some notable outliers to my, my large sweeping statement about the last hundred years. Um, the sort of goth kids in the back of the math class um, noted but generally dismissed as having too, too many caveats to demonstrate a, a paradigm for any future of architecture. So just to sort of run through a few of those um, uh, this is a, a drawing uh, from the 18th century French architect Goulet. Um, this building is the Temple of Death, sort of obvious, obvious answer. You, know, you can tell this sort of chiaroscuro rendering of them. Um, and one, a much more positive one is Cenotaph to, to Newton, um, actually a celebration of, of um, science in a way, but still rendered in this um, massive darkness as part of the project. Um, the early, these drawings uh, from Piranesi, of, this is one from his series of prisons, these sort of endless, endless dark, unfolding um, catacomb labyrinth mazes, um, as well as his much more sort of romantic um, series about the ruins of Rome. And on a more contemporary note, uh, people from the, you know, the sort of artist architects, um, Atelier von Lisu, to sort of work on these projects, that have a vulgarity to them, also a lot of humor to them, which we're going to get into a little bit, um, as well as the late, um, I think you guys all know who this is, <laughs> Labius Woods, um, and his work on these types of structures, mostly, and I think sort of most profoundly, um, having to do with places that were recently destroyed through war, um, as well as much more playful ideas, uh, like, I never know how to pronounce their name. I'm not bad with French. Heresy or RSE. Um, they're building for a, a, a tower in Thailand in which the exterior of this was supposed to be done with all these sort of electromagnets to, to collect the dust and the dirt of the city in which it, inhabit, in which, uh, it inhabits. Um, or the, the sort of really amazing uh, project by Yusozaki. Um, I've forgotten the name of it now. Electric something. But of 1968 where... He has made this sort of rendering um, depiction of a, of a post-nuclear Hiroshima where the sort of blending between what is actually being presented as new structure and that which has actually been destroyed, the line is completely blurred. You're not really sure what's new, what's old, what stands. Um, a really fascinating project. So this, this kind of should aspect of architectural practice I would like to call into question as well. Um, you know, what is the imperative of our practice? What should we be doing? And I would like to take up the cause of some of these deviants here, at least for a little bit this evening, to sort of undo a little bit of the preoccupation of light and utopia as we've described it, or as I've described it. Um, some of the first conclusions that I think we've come across while looking at some of this research has led me to um, an understanding that while 
a lot of the origins of some of these inquiries and ideas and thoughts sit in these sort of darker artistics and hidden traumas. The ramifications from some of these works have pushed, uh, pushed the research far beyond the confines of darkness alone. Um, and so I, I think in that sense, the, the sort of myopathy problem that I've been talking about, I, I, we'll get into it. Um, so our studio this semester is focusing on one of these darker topics uh, that is recent and historically relevant specifically to architecture, um, the very literal destruction of architecture. So we're asking the students to sort of think through and posit how architects can start coming to terms with the inevit inevitability of their work's ultimate demise. Um, to sort of move beyond the heroic immortality of the, the monumental architect. So I won't, I won't bore the students of our, our studio by rehashing um, the value uh, that, that we think an imperative about rethinking this inevitable possibility's impact on design. Um, instead, I'm, I'm going to focus on a, an, another correlative topic uh, within the relationship between architecture and darkness, and, and one that is not without numerous precedent studies in architecture. Um, and that would be the uncanny. Um, so I'm not here to rehash Vidler's text, uh, a fairly substantial work on the topic and its relationship to architecture. But rather, I'm going to look at it um, not from a historian's gaze, but from an architect's. Um, so really thinking about practice and what this means for me as somebody who is designing now. And so that's my interest in the uncanny. Um, not so much in... So in some sense, I'm going to undo a little bit of his conclusions, perhaps, but hopefully it's more about uh, expanding it outward um, than, you know, challenging what he sa said about it. So, in light of that, I think in going forward, I'm not going to adhere to a sort of proper analysis of Vidler's text or Freud's text on the uncanny. And there's a reason for that denial. You know, as an architect, my goal is not to create a textual argument. I work with text a lot. Uh, I find it extremely useful. But for me, it's a tool. It's a tool to make architecture. It's a tool to inform um, something physical, a project, and, you know, a different end. So my <clears throat> architecture is simply not bound up by the same adherence to a kind of logical argument the text is. Of course, a number of great writers, I think, would argue that neither is text. Um, but still, architecture does not know that kind of contemplative logic, I think, more powerfully. Um, it is material, not words. Certainly there are, are logics embedded in that that we'll get into. But. And that is also kind of a, a subplot um, to this discussion about the, the darkness interest. Um, and that is, I think, architects also might want to rethink a little bit the way they engage with text. So something else that I've sort of pulled out from this process and been working on it. Um, so for me, the, the kind of most important text or the most interesting things that I love to read are ones where I'm scribbling all over the margins making lists, um, you know, sort of engaging with this document more as a resource for interpretation and maybe more so productive misinterpretation. Um, and I also think that the problem is more often than not, at least for many people, text can kind of operate as a kind of closure to a system, right? So the biblical example of, of Adam, when he sees these animals and he starts to name them individually, then he owns them. They're his. Um, and, I, and I think in that sense, the, the magic of what those animals are seems to end. Um, and so in that sense, you know, knowledge becomes a possession as opposed to something that could lead to ideation. Um, so I, I also believe in a, a lot of the greatest work uh, of any sort of writer is to create holes, right? Whether self-aware or not, for the future generations to come along and fill. Uh, so we can't get mad at Vidler for this. He's a historian. He has other uh, interests in terms of what he's working on. But he also has allowed the opportunity for me to, to fill some of the holes as I see them. Um, so the uncanny is an aesthetic psychological condition. Um, its origins lie in what I, I guess you could call a kind of Anglo-Germanic project of sensation, which includes figures like John Locke, David Hume, and I think more pertinent, uh, in this case, Immanuel Kant and Edmund Burke. For me, the most salient aspect of this work is not its empiricism, right, the method of combining the kind of material world with uh, a human understanding, but rather how specifically these latter two thinkers' work pivots not only to human cognition, reason, and sensory perception, but also man's more base corporeal sensations and reactions to our physical world. Their work combines man's mental capacity with his, for lack of a better word, kind of animal aspect. 
Um, I think this is most apparent in Cotton Burke's work on the sublime. So this is the, the classic painting used to explain the sublime uh, by Caspar David, uh, David Friedrich of The Wanderer Above the Sea and Fog. So I'll use this quickly to explain the basic concept of part of it. So for those of you who have not been exposed to it, it is also kind of this aesthetic, psychological condition that operates primarily around fear. Its peculiarity and what differentiates it from the beautiful is that it involves this kind of guttural reaction, a reaction that precedes reason. Um, so in the dynamical sublime, uh, the way that works is a, one undergoes a kind of micro-durational process um, to achieve the sensation. First one feels threatened by an, an object. So I think in this case, you could see uh, the possibility that he might have acrophobia, right? The fear of heights. Um, so there's this sort of fear and adrenaline and something physical and animal that you respond to. But then one realizes that one is actually not in danger, right? He's actually standing on firm ground. Um, the wind's not blowing. He's, he's sort of safe, right? Um, and in that transition from fear into finding an, uh, sort of the intellectual process of realizing that you're safe, a kind of pleasure um, emerges. And that's what the sublime is, ostensibly, the sort of pleasure of the intellect and uh, sort of combined with this animal aspect. Um, there are other versions and nuances to the sublime, the mathematical sublime, and many others, which also I think is sort of depicted in this painting. But for the interest of time, let's, let's sort of stick with that one. Um, another important takeaway here, going to the next story, is that the sort of world of stuff, of things, of objects, does have the ability to strike fear and other guttural reactions in us. Um, it's not necessarily the threat of other people or other moving things. Stuff has that possibility. Um, the purists will say architecture or sort of anything man-made cannot create the feeling of the sublime. <clears throat> However, even in Kant and Burke's own texts, there are moments where that argument is undone. Um, and we'll get into this. The, whether, the question of a man-made and, and way can execute these types of sensations. So the uncanny, on the other hand, this is a painting from um, Balthus, the French painter from 1953 called The Room. Um, the uncanny, on the other hand, like a number of other darker areas of thought that we've been looking at, recently holds a particular relevance to us. Its origins are fundamentally architectural. The German word for uncanny is unheimlich. A literal translation means sort of unhomely. Um, and beyond the etymological, as Widler has pointed out in his reading of Freud, the home is often a primary instrument um, and a stage in the production of uncanny effects. Um, the uncanny is aesthetic psychological category uh, that even Freud argues has a, a pretty loose and sort of not clearly defined edge. This is a, um, a, a painting by the uh, Georgian artist uh, Andro Wekua called Get Out of My Room. Um, it is easier to call something uncanny sort of as it's experienced uh, rather than going through the checkboxes of the uncanny attributes in an effort to reconstruct it in some way. Um, it is a loose form unlike the specificity of the sublime. One of Wittler's major points in his analysis is that the uncanny, like the sublime, is something that architecture alone cannot produce. As it relies on a sort of melding of an actual physical architectural space and a psychological familiarity in the subject. He claims that the uncanny lies in a projected mental space rather than an actual space. And while this is true, I think the analysis falls, falls short a bit in terms of assessing the value of that logic of the uncanny in architecture. So there are a few tenets worth highlighting that I think characterize something as uncanny. First, at its core, the uncanny is rooted in a kind of intellectual uncertainty. Uh, this uncertainty, as Freud points out in his synopsis of E.T.A. Hoffman's short story, The Sandman, allows for a presence to be felt. But the nature of that presence is uncertain. The man visiting the child's father in the evening could be the Sandman, ready to pluck out his eyes and take them away from him, um, but he might not. Something could be threatening, but it might not be. Um, and I, I believe there's a powerful opportunity for architecture in this model of uncertainty alone. You know, as Walter Benjamin has pointed out in his essay on mechanical reproduction, architecture primarily is experienced in a state of distraction. Um, it surrounds us, and it provides us the backdrop to our lives, sort of slipping into our consciousness through the back door, not as a contemplative object that we stare about and think about, but as a low-grade persistence in our consciousness. Thus, our interaction with the object of architecture is a, is a very peculiar nature, unlike other objects. 
And I believe the possibility for this uncertainty to reside in the kind of low-grade persistence um, could prove a powerful force in allowing architecture to find new cultural values outside of modernity's obsession with utopia and its correlative symptoms of clarity and transparency. And Offman's Sandman, the story that Freud quotes in his text, or um, summarizes, the reader ultimately discovers the identity of the man through the told narrative. And while Freud states that narrative fiction holds more possibility uh, to hold the uncanny than a, a personal encounter because of the sort of plasticity of the laws of nature, whereas in a piece of fiction, um, you really can run the gamut in terms of uh, allowing and playing with this kind of uncertainty. Um, you know, our personal encounters with our surroundings hold the possibility that this uncertainty may never end, right? So in The Sandman, in the end, you do understand his identity. But in architecture, there's the possibility for that never to happen. Um, I think uncertainty in architecture could have the potential to linger, staying hidden in the distraction of our everyday lives. A power in this distracted understanding retooled from threatening into other methods. Um, another sculptural work by the same Georgian artist, um, Andro Waku, I believe this one is untitled. The second major tenet of the uncanny is whether something familiar, when something familiar becomes unfamiliar. Um, here's where architecture cannot produce the uncanny on its own. So for this process to occur, it requires the knowledge of an antecedent state that has dwelled long enough to become familiar by the subject, right? A state of normal against which a sense of change can be registered. Um, a threatening change or possibly not a threatening change. Now, obviously, not all change is uncanny. Um, and this is the trouble and, I think, opportunity with looking at the uncanny from an architectural altruistic standpoint. Um, it's nuanced subtlety and how to work with it. And in an effort to mine these sort of darker themes for ideas and thoughts that have relevance beyond their sort of darker borders, to some degree, perhaps the uncanny might actually be the sort of easiest among many of them to, to uh, shake the stigma of. Um, a third tenant, this is a still from a video by the um, British artist Ed Atkins, also derived from sort of uncertainty and subtlety. Um, the sense that something inanimate is actually becoming animate, or vice versa. Something that is animate is actually not. So, you know, fundamental, a dead body is considered uncanny. Right? It should be moving, but it's not. The classic example of this uh, is also, you know, within cyborgs or avatars. Uh, there was a, a robotic scientist named, you know, Masahiro Mori who came up with this theory called the Unval Uncanny Valley Theory, um, where within robotics and computer animation, as an avatar or cyborg, cyborg approaches verisimilitude to a human, um, it, we get repulsed by it, right? So early on, when you see a sort of early robot, like Asimov, he's sort of cute, kind of funny, he's sort of, he's personified. But as it starts to get more and more closer to a form that we recognize, um, we get grossed out by it. Um, it. We get repulsed. And this last, and the last tenant I'll mention today um, is a notion of a kind of unintentional return, or a kind of doubling. So this, this one is also, I think, of particular interest of architecture to try to retool, um, as it is this sort of circular um, circumambulation, right? The act of moving through and finding oneself at the very same point or similar place that one once was, that sort of deja vu. Um, the doubling nature of this could be particularly fruitful, I think, in architecture, if combined maybe with Benjamin's discourse on the copy in his aforementioned essay, right? So could the uncanny possibly suggest a method to turn Benjamin's logic on his head. So rather than the copy being this kind of tool for the, the popular aura-defeating method of kind of artistic diffusion, could we actually use the copy to do something else? You know, to use that verisimilitude to actually create something other or strange or new. So as I've claimed, architecture, I think at least since the modern movement, has overlooked this area of thought, these darker trajectories, darker themes. Um, and as you can tell, I found it fairly helpful to look beyond architecture, to find precedents and developments of work and thought um, that I find relevant and interesting on these topics. So it's not really by choice that I keep looking towards literature or visual arts or sculpture or philosophy. Um, frankly, given what I think is a dearth of projects within our discipline, um, it's really a necessity. So 
for, I, I'd like now to look at one such body of work as a kind of case study um, for what possible outcomes the logic of the uncanny could have for architecture. So if I were to see this in a gallery, which I have not actually, I would describe the sculpture as having a kind of uncanny quality. Um, I think it fulfills a number of the, the tenets uh, that I would describe previously. Um, I'd have some other ones which we'll discuss, humor, one of them. Um, however, it is also a work of art, right? A man-made object, um, something that Vidler claimed is impossible. And I think he's still correct to some degree. Um, this, incidentally, is a, a piece by Mike Kelly as part of a larger project. Um, so the uncanny effects requires, the, again, the mental projection of a psych psychological space constructed from an antecedent familiarity with the object, um, or rather aspects of the object, then juxtaposed to what it is now. There's an uncertainty of what, what it should be or what it is. So the human form, the boot, the pattern of the clothing, the white trim, all of these things are, are aspects that I recognize, that I know, right? Um, so in that sense, I think the, um, these exist in my consciousness as this kind of antecedent normal state. Um, without my pre-knowledge of the specificity of this particular figure beforehand. And so I, there's aspects, you know, therefore, arguably, uh, that are shared between me and the artist. Um, and because of this, the man-made object can produce a feeling of the uncanny. And it also seems like it, sh also it, it seems like it could be animated as well, so another one of those tenets. But I think that's a huge part of the interest in, in this particular project, is thinking through and how, how the uncanny, specifically with Mike Kelly's work, can start to use tropes, use things that we know, um, and actually take that sort of basic um, understanding outside of a postmodern context um, and bring it into a, another way of using it. Um, this sculpture is part of a large video, sculptural performance, and installation work um, entitled Day is Done, originally shown at the Gagosian Gallery in 2005. Um, it's part of a series of works which collectively, um, sorry, one sec, which uh, collectively are entitled uh, the Extracurricular Activity Project Reconstructions, um, of which this is actually the first. Um, and I did get the chance to see a portion of these works um, at his posthumous retrospective that happened at MoMA PS1 last year. So most, uh, much of Mike Kelly's work could easily be considered architectural. Um, this one seems fairly obvious. Uh, his earlier projects, before this even, many of them were performance space and utilized space as a fundamental attribute um, of, or a consistent material in the construction of the work. And more recently, and I think overtly, um, his sculpture, The Educational Complex, the work from 1995, has outright been thoroughly accepted into architectural discourse. Um, there is an essay also by Anthony Vidler on this um, particular sculpture and others who have analyzed this work within the architectural history. Um, yet here again, I think Vidler misses some opportunities in the ramifications of Kelly's work for architecture, um, mostly to do with projects that um, Kelly produced after this work. So this actually preceded the, the leg installation that we looked at. Um, and so, you know, while I'm more interested in that body of work that happens after this and was very much informed by this, since this informs that, I'll, I'll spend a couple minutes just explaining this project. Um, Another installation view. Um, so the, uh, uh, the educational complex is a conglomeration of scaled architectural models of the schools where Kelly was educated. Um, it also includes one of his childhood homes, uh, which you can see here. Um, however, the models, unlike the way this depiction suggests, the models are, were not constructed out of a sort of accurate reproduction of the sampling of the original structure, so this is the original house up on the top left. The rather Kelly constructed these exclusively from memory, um, modeling and filling in the architectural spaces, walls, enclosures, roofs, windows, um, based on his mental projections of the space, his memory of being in them. And with this filter of memory, the work, as he stated, constructs spaces of abuse and trauma, um, akin to Freud's uncanny in, in its sort of expression of repressed childhood potential. Uh, and I think you'll see in the next slide. This is uh, the school, I believe it's St. Mary's, um, one of the schools that he attended. Um, and as you can see, a number of these structures show large holes, as you can see in the roof on the right. Um, areas where Kelly's memory failed him, um, where a kind of a vacuum of mentally projected space exists. 
the codification of this kind of emptiness of spatial memory and the passive imprint of the surrounding architectures on a, a man's consciousness. Um, so, I mean, besides the, the points about this space, I think another, other areas where this, I think, is particularly relevant to architecture is, uh, in terms of a method, is it's a way of him making an architectural model, something you guys do all the time, but in an incredibly personal way, right? His, his entire persona is built into this. this is, these are his memories. These are not actual structures. Um, these are the memories of structures. There's this other filter, and he's involving himself and therefore producing a kind of vulnerability in himself by putting this kind of a work out there. Um, and I, I think, of course, it's interesting, too, that he uses this sort of whitewashed standard, you know, um, uh, museum board architectural model status. So it, it, there's a way that it's been sort of uh, packaged for us to consume and it somewhat masks that, uh, that interest or that thick psychology that sits behind it. Um, so the trauma aspect of his work is actually something that came to him as a bit of a surprise. Um, this is one of the works that he produced before that project um, in a series called, uh, each one was a numerated arena. So arena one, arena two. Um, and this early set of works constructed mostly of stuffed animals and fabrics give off a kind of, I think, disorienting, um, an eerie, uncanny feeling. Um, achieved again through another example of a sort of a shared set of cultural references that me as an observer, you know, that I share with the artist um, for a sort of projected psychological space. Um, the dolls have been placed and thus in the absence of the, the animator appear animate to some degree in and of themselves. This absence of the actor, I think, also renders these assemblages as suggesting a space of a kind of repressed trauma, a trauma and fear constructed out of everyday objects that simply, through their arrangement, can take on a powerful um, state of aversion or repulsion. Um, yet they also take on a category of kitsch, uh, I think, in terms of their adherence to low kind of bad taste forms in the gallery context, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but in an interview with Kelly, and this is another later sculpture uh, where he's, again, working with the stuffed animal theme. Um, he stated that when he assembled these sculptures, he meant them to be a commentary on and a sort of discussion of commodity culture, um, something that he abhorred. But then the overwhelming sense of trauma that were, seemed to be innate in these, uh, he found out from critics. Multiple critics were reviewing these works and describing the state of, of trauma and, and childhood. And, um, and it came to a surprise to Kelly, and so as such, he decided that there's something to that, and he wanted to sort of deal and, and I think for the rest of his lifetime work on this project where he's getting into the kind of power of some of these, um, you know, images of references and making them uncanny, making them um, creepy, making them have a po more power than they should have. Um, and it's this sort of quality in the materials, objects, and images um, that I, I think is really fascinating. Um, so this is an installation view of The Day is Done. Uh, this was, I believe, in the Gagosian, uh, where it's originally, um, it was originally staged as this sort of film, and then he sort of scattered it all within the room, both with pieces of the sets of previous things, some of the costumes. Um, there are figures that we'll, we'll see in here that actually, again, sort of reproduce some of the bodies that were actually then in the performances. So while it is a two and a half hour, you know, musical theater piece, it's then restrung in this architectural space where it's not about narrative at all. It's about moving through these spaces and, and understanding these images and juxtapositions of things that are familiar but completely disorienting and um, I think uncanny and creepy. Um, but also cut with a lot of humor. Um, <clears throat> so the works... Sorry, one sec. The works uh, centerpiece in the way his process, which I think is a big important part about the work and why I want to talk about it, um, for getting into this, was he decided, he grew up in Detroit in the 70s, and he was going to take this period uh, that he was in high school, four years, and collect newspapers from that period in and around the town where he grew up. So people who had shared experiences with him, and this is an example of one of them. And he was going to find the images in these local newspapers and pull them out and use those as a basis to recreate this, um, this film and then ultimately installation. So here are uh, a large array of a number of the still, the black and white obviously being the photographs that he pulled from newspapers, and the color ones being stills from the videos where he reenacted uh, and recreated the exact same project. So again, there's a sort of strange copy happening. I think there's a, uh, a, definitely a, an interesting uh, possibility there, a way of using this 
sort of really basic, um, sort of trashy almost uh, aspect of, of culture. Um, and I, I, there's also a lot of humor to it too. A lot of these photos, of course, were sort of Halloween based. Um, also somewhat strangely timed with this lecture. Um, lots of Draculas. Um, and you can see the level of detail that he goes into recreating these, where even the audience in the background, the cheerleaders who are sitting back there, they're all sort of in this. Um, but it, the way that he sort of now divorced that from its original image, where we don't actually even know these people, but it's still familiar, but unfamiliar. Um, I, there's a w real interesting model there, I think. Um, and the way that you know, we can start to work with these kind of everyday aspects of um, cast-off culture. Armor. Definitely, I think, one of the creepier ones of a ritual. Um, and then this one, as you can see, the kneeling figure in the front here in the installation, in addition to being depicted in photography and video, also became a sculpture, but one absent of an actual human. Um, <clears throat> So the, I think the piece is a sort of, you know, create, musical creation with all these collateral objects and sets, and um, it really is an interesting sort of, sort of crazy recombination of experiences in a very spatial way. Um, but I think that the real takeaways from this, in terms of his particular process with this project for architecture, are, um, I mean, copying is a classic thing that we've been dealing with, right? How do, how do you deal with a copy? It's a modern state of um, artistic production. And I think he's reusing it in such an interesting way, <clears throat> um, you know, dealing with something that's a copy that nobody cares about to some degree, a 40-year-old photograph from somebody in high school, and making it in something uh, vital and um, empowering and using, not empowering, but, you know, something you have to really react to. And it presents this whole concept of, of using copies in a, a much more radicalized way. I think it also <clears throat> presents, and particularly for architecture, a way to deal and rethink the everyday, right? So... I mean, what if there's something to this that we could bring in that kind of massive quantity of, of little A architecture into the rubric of capital A architecture and retool it and reuse it and sort of toss it back in its face? Um, I think there's a way to do it without the black humor uh, and cynicism um, that he uses. But I, I think that, that nature of uncanny and, and being able to think through what are the ways that we can actually deal with that um, guttural response and that you know animal tendency of, of what the way these make us feel to sort of take the kind of idea of the everyday and and well beyond the sort of social values of Denise Scott Brown um, and take it to this point of danger maybe or unnerving or uncomfortableness um, so not to quote it but to, to allow it to align with these powerful mental and aesthetic forces um, I think in that case too one could easily rethink context so not simply uh, ignoring it or just adhering to it, but making small moves, subtle moves that actually allow for the context itself to seem strange. Um, this is part of the installation of that, the day is done. Um, this is part of a sort of outdoor series, um, and one of the wigged actors gets remade in this ivy um, through a, a wood stump on which the same wig is laid. Um, and so uh, I think another interest here is also efficiency, right? There's a, there's a way that he makes easy an intellectual project. That's sort of throwing in things that you find, trash to most people, um, and making it into something that uh, is really powerful. And I, I think that sort of efficiency and using easy as a kind of critical term is also a, a real possibility for us to, to think about um, what this could do for architecture and how these sort of creepier things could actually be a real um, positive force. And sort of move beyond the, the classic heroic kind of cult to the new of, of getting a different kind of, of new. You know, something built off of this type of quotidian. Um, so to sort of kind of wrap it up, I think as architects, we are missing opportunities. Um, we must sort of move beyond the imperative to fix problems at all costs. A process that I think can have positive outcomes, but also, almost, but also I think uh, can produce a kind of blindness, um, sort of forced solutions that are ill-conceived codifications of repressed cultural anxiety, producing powerful works of accidental cynicism, I think, in this case. I think it's imperative that we in improve the world around us, obviously, but in order to do this, we need to perhaps take um, things a little bit more personally, <clears throat> more uh, animally, even, at times, um, this is another work from, from Mike Kelly's. 
and another installation from the same series, but after the day is done. To sort of understand the gamut of human tendencies, both in its most reasonable, um, as well as its most uncomfortable, and allow ourselves to dwell in these, feel this discomfort, understand it, consider it, and work with it. Um, I think discomfort can be a powerful force, a vulnerability that if we were to become more versed in, uh, might prevent our teleological utopian dreams from, from blinding us to a plethora of valuable ideas whose origins may like, lie in darker corners, but its conclusions have the capacity to reach far outside them. Um, I think it's time for us to sort of reclaim this body of work, um, which from our disciplinary neighbor's seemingly exclusive license. Um, as Adorno has stated in a very short, posthumously published essay entitled Black as an Ideal, if works of art are to survive in the context of extremity and darkness, which is social reality, and if they are to avoid being sold as mere comfort, they have to assimilate themselves to that reality. Um, and I think Adorno is not simply talking about extremes, like this uh, image from the, no the graphic novel Akira. Um, he includes the phrase social reality. A reality is no longer extreme, it's every day. Uh, while this could be considered depressing and awful, I do not think it has to be. Um, and this is, I see sort of architecture's power to operate in this, this void as I see it. You know, architecture and design hold this potential to work with the everyday. Uh, the patterns of use, habit, and occupation to operate subtly and effectively produce new aesthetics, new values outside the tired rhetoric of utopia or associated shock culture of the pursuit of the new. Um, so I think we should sort of work on the logic of the creepy. Um, so I think that's kind of where I'll end it. Um, but happy to answer any questions. the end of your talk, you were, um, I, I guess in a way, I'm not sure if you use this word, but a lot about defamiliarization mm -hmm. and this idea of the strange of taking elements out of context and seeing them anew. And I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit towards um, what, uh, I, I think in particular in, in relationship to Kelly's work, where I think you were it was great to see, actually, in the way that you presented it was, was super. I'm, I'm wondering, for architecture, if you can talk about how uh, or, or what kinds of, of uh, ends might be associated with those uh, techniques of defamiliarization, mm -hmm. strangeness, or creepiness. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, part of the answer to that question is we're sort of just starting to think about this project. So I, I certainly don't know those conclusions yet. But some things that I've thought about while working on this would be that um, <clears throat> If there would be a way, for instance, to um, take sort of normative aspects of, of architecture and materials that are used all the time and every day, um, and a way to actually tweak them only slightly or something like that, to call attention to it, to, to make it something um, much more extreme and sort of protesting, that then could maybe within at least capital A architecture could then be sort of, um, I don't know, maybe digested and thought about in a more detailed way, to bring in the constant quantity of all of this other architecture that doesn't involve many people in this room, um, and, and to bring that into our discourse and discussion. I mean, maybe it could go back in the same way, you know, that there's a way that through these sort of subtle moves or creepy moves that, that people could start to get some of these ideas back into the, the, the normal situation, right? I mean, the classic um, sort of fashion example of something like this is when, you know, one of the, the big houses makes a huge move with a specific color, then there's this sort of obvious trickle-down situation. But is there a way for us to build something like that in a much, much different way? Um, but I, I also think there's something really fantastic about this work in a way to think about easy, you know, in a, in a way to use that in a very intellectual possibility. I think OMA's work sometimes does that um, and uses this sort of quick collage, you know, and other things that, that start to um, make it okay to do something quick. Make it okay to something um, that's actually quickly consumed, um, and therefore maybe perhaps engage with that bigger community in some way. Um, 
if that answers your question. <laughs> things. One, I think um, Herzog and Demeron is a really good example to think through that. But even I think in the history of the sublime, it's not just pure sensation. It is that cognition, right? right? Like I, I really see it as this, this duality where you have that fear, or at least in the dynamical, you know, where you have that fear, but then you realize intellectually that you're actually fine. Yeah. And I, I, I think there's, you talk yourself off the cliff, you right. know? And so I think in that sense, that level of sensation is always engaged with cognition to some degree. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think the work of Herzog and Demeron has, has also been really, um, really interesting in playing with some of those thoughts, right? So if you, um, a much, a little older building, like their work with the, um, I'm going to forget the artist, but the, you know, the, the leaves that are on the Ricola, one of the Ricola warehouses, the way that they, it obviously is a kind of ornamentation. But at the same time, if it's something that you actually do take the time to look at, which you don't have to, because if you see a grid, you know, like any Warhol, a hundred of these things, it's about the grid, it's about the quantity of them. Um, but if you do take the time to look at that, uh, there's a way in which the cognitive aspect of what that is relates to the brand of Ricola in a way, right? This sort of um, kind of throwback culture of really believing in um, herbal medicine. And, and so I think in that sense, they're actually using some of these um, ways of the cognition to kind of throw you back into the architecture in a way. So there's a way, I, I think that some of their work allows that cognitive analysis to go back to space, which I, I think there's, there's sort of a, some fascinating examples in their work where they, they do that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a re uh, renewed interest in meaning and association, much more so than there was maybe 10 years mm -hmm. ago. And that's why I think a figure like Haduck is now uh, relied upon more for reference. Mm -hmm. and I think Vidler writes about him in, in mm -hmm. the book as well, like that there's a understanding of some type of cognitive connection in his work through figuration, but also a sense of mystery and myth with the fact that those aren't singular or literal. Mm -hmm. and it seems to me that that becomes a productive way to think about how those ideas translate into architecture when it has to be more about form and space and maybe less about a stage set. Mm -hmm. That seems like an interesting way to put it. I don't know. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's also the trouble with you know, looking at Kelly's work is like it, it's such a stage set, and there's so much black humor in it. And I mean, I think humor needs more place in architecture sure, too. Sure. But uh, I'm not saying we need to do his sort of black humor aspect of it. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of troubles in translating this for sure that we're kind of starting to get into and thinking about now. But. Yeah. I want you to share your drawings. <laughs> I'm wondering, um, as follow on the Herzog and Demerol piece. You know, is the is the project or is the project that emerges out of this is it is it material? And I think of someone like that could, that could be anywhere from someone like Smithson to Bill Bollinger. Um, is it uh, representational? You're looking internal to the, our techniques in a way, producing the, the unfamiliar by virtue of a certain kind of abuse of convention. Mm -hmm. Or um, abuse is the wrong term, but I'll keep it there. Um, or, or in the production of the copy, to what degree does the, does the copy need figural presence? And there I might think of something like the 
So that the copies we see in Kelly, it seemed to me, we understand as copies, at least in part, because they have a kind of digital presence already. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering in your work, um, how many ways are you, are you playing, if you will, towards the, towards the uncanny? Sorry, towards the? Towards the uncanny. Um, how many different ways are you playing it? And I'm, I'm trying to lay out, we'll say, three. Mm -hmm. um, one's the computational technique, one's mm -hmm. the material piece, one's really closer, I think, much closer to, <coughs> to Haydock, is more figurative. Mm -hmm. That it understands that the copy it needs a kind of figural status to begin with. Right. Um, and so I want to know, you know, what's, you know, what's, yeah. what are in those drawings? Right. You know, well, I mean, the, the easy answer to that is those drawings are only just starting, so <laughs> I don't know the answer. But I think one thing that I've been, that, that made me think a lot about um, as perhaps an example is that, uh, I mean, for me, the, the uncanny aspect of it, like if you, if you were to use a, a music example, you know, if you think about a minimalist composer, there's a copy, like a, you know, a, a Philip Glass, there's a copy of this sort of arpeggiation that happens and repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. So it's kind of a musical figure that happens over and over again. And it generates a rhythm and it generates a copy. I'm sort of, I think that Uncanny is more interested in the drone. You know, it's something that just sits there. It just hangs there. You're not sure if there's a rhythm to it, if it's going to stop, if it's going to end. After a while, you forget it's even there. And it, it's that sort of blurred idea of whether it's there or not that I think is kind of super interesting that I haven't figured the answer to yet, but I've been thinking about it, if that helps a little bit. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, although this question is not too complicated, you were talking more like the, the fear of like, oh, something bad's gotta happen, but then you're like, okay, nothing really bad's gotta happen, it like, makes you feel good, right? What that kind of reminds me of is like in, in the, this Grand Canyon Skywalk, where you, it's like eighty, you're like eighty or something feet out, and it's just glass underneath you. Mm -hmm. is, is that something you're talking about? Because like I went there and there was this guy who was like blue, he was holding his breath, like death grip on the rail. Mm -hmm. But like, and there's other people just like having a good time because like you're not gonna actually fall. Is that is that something like the way you're talking about? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that would be an example of the. The sublime in some way. I mean, the, Kant would argue that that's not the sublime. Architecture can't produce it, right? He, he says only nature can allow that to happen. Um, I mean, so in that sense, um, you know, there's some speculation. But I, I think it is that. It's that back and forth between your physical guttural feeling and your intellectual knowledge of you, um, you know, counteracting that feeling. That sort of, you know, humanness where we can actually endure pain in a way, right? So... We like spicy food. It doesn't just turn us off. It actually, there's something strange about it, <laughs> you know. Yep. <laughs> we'll end on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.